This afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Mark Zuckerberg, which is one of our guest speakers this uh, semester, to come and talk a little bit about computer science in the real world. As most of you probably know, as you guys are all do this much more than I do, founder of Facebook.com, which is a social networking program, whatever you want to call it, used at over 2,000 schools uh, across the nation and possibly the world. Is it the world too, or just the nation? Okay. So uh, good influence for you know, doing some things in computer science. He's going to tell us some of the background of it and, and what's been important and so forth. So please join me in welcoming. Yo. All right, cool. This is the first time I ever have had to hold one of these things. So I'm just going to attach it really quickly. One second. Is this good? Is this amplified at all? Yeah. All right, sweet. So, um, you know, this is like one of the first times I've been to a lecture at Harvard. Um, but, um, <laughs> but, you know, I, so I guess like what's probably going to be most useful for you guys if I just take you through some of the courses that I took at Harvard where I actually did go to lecture sometimes. I was joking. And, um, and sort of like how different decisions that I had to make when I was moving along with Facebook got impacted by different stuff that I was learning in the classes that I was taking. And you know, if all goes according to plan, then maybe some of you guys will come out of this thinking that taking CS or engineering stuff at Harvard is actually sort of useful. So that's the game plan. Um, I think that this is slotted for two hours. There's no way I'm going to speak for two hours. I'll probably speak for like 20 minutes or 15 minutes, and then I'll just let you guys ask questions, because I'm sure you guys have more interesting stuff to ask me than I can come up with to talk about myself. So um, OK. So I guess I'll just kind of get started. Um, when I was here, I started off taking 121. I never actually took 50. So I'm probably, you know, you should have gotten the, the other guy who was doing Facebook, Dustin Moskovitz, who is my roommate. When we got started, um, the site was written in PHP, which isn't something that you learn in one of these classes. But fortunately, if you have a good background in C, the syntax is very similar. And you can pick it up in like, you know, like a day or two. So um, we started. I started writing the site and um, launched it at Harvard in February 2004, so I guess almost two years ago now. And within a couple of weeks, a few thousand people had signed up. And we started getting some emails from people at other colleges asking for us to launch it at their schools. And I was taking 161 at the time, so I don't know if you guys know like the reputation of that course. But it, I mean, it was kind of heavy. Um, it was a really fun course, but it didn't leave me with much time to do anything else with Facebook. So my roommate, Dustin, who I guess had just finished CS50, was like, hey, I, I want to help out. I want to do the expansion and, like, and help you figure out how to do the stuff. So I was like, you know, that's pretty cool, dude. But you don't really know any PHP or anything like that. So that weekend, he went home, bought the book Pearl for Dummies, came back, and was like, all right, I'm ready to go. I was like, dude, the site's written in PHP, not Pearl. But you know, that's cool. So he picked up PHP um, over you know, like a few days. Because I promise that if you have a good background in C, like PHP is a very simple thing to pick up. And, um, and he just kind of went to work. So I mean, the first big decision that we really had to make was in how to kind of expand the architecture to go from the single school type setup that we had when it was just at Harvard to something that supported multiple schools. So I mean, this was a decision that kind of had to be made on a bunch of levels, both like in the product and how we wanted privacy to work. But I think that one really important decision that's helped us scale pretty well is how we decided to distribute the data. So I, mean, I don't know how much of like kind of complexity stuff and like big O notation you guys do in this class. Uh, okay. So I mean, one of the most complicated computations that we do on the site is the computation to tell how you're connected to people, right? Because I mean, if you can imagine that stored as sort of a series of um, of I guess undirected it's not weighted. Um, so undirected, unweighted pairs of ID numbers of people in the database. Then if you want to figure out who's friends with someone, you have to look at all their friends. Right? So that's maybe like 100 or 200 people. But then if you want to figure out like who's a friend of a friend or what the closest connection is there, then you kind of have to look at the 100 or 200 friends of each of those friends. So it becomes, in, like at each level, a, there's another factor of n multiplied in, the, where n is the number of friends that 
the person that all each of your friends has. So you can see that this kind of becomes exponentially difficult to to solve for the shortest path between people. So I mean, if you're just looking for a friend of a friend that's n squared, if you're looking for a friend of a friend of a friend that's n cubed, and I mean that's something that traditionally was pretty difficult for a lot of the predecessor sites to Facebook. So and for example, Friendster had large problems with this because they were trying to compute paths six degrees out or like seven degrees out. And I mean that's something that when you're doing like n seventh, like that just is really, I guess, very hard. And you know, took down their site for a while. So I mean, one of the things that we took that we kind of had in mind when we were figuring out how to do this was how do you distribute the database in such a way that this computation becomes manageable. So what we decided was that everyone um, on the site does most of their activity at the school that they're kind of based at. So I mean, if you're at Harvard, then you know, like most of the people who you're going to be seeing or transacting with on the site are going to be at Harvard. It's actually probably like 90% of the stuff that you do on the site. So we decided to split up the databases and create one um, instance of a MySQL database for each school on the network. And um, in doing that, we, I mean, if you notice, the, the paths that we compute are only within the school. So instead of, say, like now we're at 6 million users, and um, you know, instead of having to do n cubed over some portion of 6 million, it's just n cubed over 10,000, which is a much more manageable, I guess, type of computation. So that was sort of the first like, big architectural decision that we had to make that contributed to us not dying a few months later. Um, and I don't know, it was probably like a pretty important one. So I mean, is, when we first started, set up the site, we had um, just one computer that we were running. It wasn't in our dorm room. We were renting it. I kind of learned my lesson for trying to run a computer, uh, like run a site out of my dorm room a few months earlier. And Harvard almost tried to kick me out. So, um, like, so I ended up renting a server off site this time, and um, and I guess like running originally the database and the web server. So Apache is what we were using in this instance. To, to serve the pages from the same machine. And because we distributed the databases in the way that we did, we were able to, as time went on, just add more machines linearly and sort of just grow the site without having any kind of exponential expansion on the amount of machinery that we had. But after we hit, say, about like 30 or 50 schools, we started running into, we started realizing that we could start getting more performance out of MySQL or Apache. Um, and that, <coughs> Like some of the way that stuff was set up just like wasn't as optimal as it could be. So I mean, for example, when you have MySQL machines and Apache machines on the same, or like MySQL and Apache running on the same server, then if something happens to that server, then not only does the database for that school or the schools on that server just stop kind of responding in a way that is like that will get you anything useful. But you can't even load any web pages, so you get page not found. And that kind of sucks. But um, another issue is that the variance and the use from school to school is also not going to be perfect. So I mean, some schools are always going to be kind of have heavier use. I mean, we have schools now like Penn State that have 50,000 users, and then the majority of the schools I think still have less than 2,000 users. You know, just because there's a lot of small schools and a lot of schools that don't have complete ubiquity. So. Um, so I mean, in trying to deal with this issue and like kind of make it so that you could deal with the fact that you know Penn State had 50,000 people and just a ton of users all the time, and then you have some schools that don't, what we decided to do is separate out some of the web servers from the database servers and make it so that you can um, so that we just had a pool of Apache web servers that we could. Um, load balance between and make it so that you can use those uniformly while just having the database layer be sort of consistent. So um, I don't know if this stuff is interesting to you guys at all. Uh, or like, or I mean, if this is anything that like that matters to you know what you guys are studying now. I mean, so if there's more stuff that like you guys would rather know about in terms of the architecture, then I'll kind of like leave that open to questions later. So I'm um, just that I don't spend a lot of time like just talking about like random applications that you guys might not ever care to use. But like, um, let me try to find some interesting examples. So I mean, so I guess like 
one of the things that was pretty interesting was just sort of trying to, like, when we got to a point in terms of traffic where we started maxing out the performance of some of these open source applications that are generally pretty performant. So, for example, um, MySQL is a really good open source database. All right, and I don't know if any of you guys sort of in your own time mess around and like make anything with MySQL or have used it in any way. But like, I mean, it's pretty easy to use, and it's also like decently quick. You know, indices work pretty well. It's not as fully featured as something like Oracle, but it's pretty good. And I mean, we got to a point where I think around when we started doing like maybe a hundred million page views a day, that um, that we started running into some bottlenecks on that. So like, um, so for example, a typical query on MySQL might take like two to four milliseconds, and I mean that's not that much, but like when you're doing 100 billion of page views a day and each page view might have like 30 to 50 queries, I mean, especially if you're doing something like a profile view that just kind of queries all kinds of different information, then that kind of starts to suck. So we started to develop a caching sort of layer that, that kind of allowed quicker access to some of the information. And originally we were using another open source application, Memcache, which I don't know if any of you guys have any experience with that. but like. It was pretty quick. It got access times down to like, I guess like 0.3 to 0.5 milliseconds, which is pretty good. But it also like has a bunch of sort of distribution issues. Um, and I mean, it's supposed to be like a distributed hash table sort of application where it's like you can just attach like any number of memcache boxes in a cluster and be able to just like hook it up and have it go. But we sort of ran into a lot of issues there where like different memcache boxes would go down, and there was no redundancy on the information. So like, when a memcache box went down and you had a cache miss, then all of a sudden like, you had a lot more traffic going to a, like, a specific set of databases, and that would suck. So, um, so as time went on, we even kind of like, outgrew memcache and sort of the indices on MySQL. And I mean, we still use that stuff, but we had to build on top of that extra redundancy. And I mean, I think that like that's something that's probably like maybe a little interesting. But I mean, I'll let you guys ask me more questions about that later. I'm like not really sure what would be interesting to talk about right now. Um, maybe you guys could help out a little. <laughs> Go for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I think that, like, so that's not a technical question at all. But, um, like, I don't know. I mean, so I guess I'll just, like, go into question time now, because, like, I'm not really sure what's, like, relevant stuff for me to be discussing. So I'll just answer this, and then anyone else who wants to ask me questions can just go for that. Um, I mean, I guess like I never really spent a lot of time worrying about stuff like, I mean, there are companies out there like Google that could just sort of get into your space and do whatever you want at any time. And I mean, I think that like one of the cool things about, about like this time in technology is that individuals are leveraged and able to do way more than they'd really ever been able to do before. You know, and like even like four years ago when Google was started, I mean, now they have hundreds of thousands of machines, you know, and probably billions of dollars spent on equipment. I think like the generation before Google, you couldn't even make a site without sort of like some big piece of hardware. And I think uh, like eBay, for example, ran off of two like fifty thousand dollar machines or something. And like it's like you just can't start doing that if you're just a kid in a dorm room, you know. So I think that like the fact that we could sort of rent machines for, you know, like $100 a month and use that to scale up to a point where we had 300,000 users is, is pretty cool. And it's a pretty unique thing that, like, that's going on in technology right now. And I mean, it, it like, makes it so that instead of worrying about just, like, who's sort of the big player and, like, 
what is Google going to do next? You can do more of like, um, you could just like get a lot of stuff done. And, and I mean, instead of like having to go out and have some of the traditional business problems, like you have to raise capital before you can make anything, like that's no longer an issue. So you can just like, you're leveraged to do a lot more on your own now. I don't, I don't know if that kind of answers the question that you're asking, but I mean, I mean, it's sort of, it's one of the reasons why I think that at this point it makes a lot of sense to be studying this stuff. Because like, it, like at no point in the past could you leverage like such a small amount of money to get powerful enough technology to really touch people in the way that you can today. So I mean, Google does about 250 million page views a day, right? They have hundreds of thousands of machines and like 5,000 employees. Um, Facebook does 400 million page views a day. So that's like almost, you know, I mean, that's like a lot more than Google does, you know? And we have hundreds of machines and we just passed 50 employees. So like, and that's just like a, a sort of a technical generation of three or four years in the architectures that were created. So I mean, and then you go like three or four years back before that to from like eBay to Google and it's just completely different because I mean, at least Google is running off of this, like a lot of distributed equipment that I mean, they have hundreds of thousands of machines, but the idea there was get a lot of shitty machines, you know, that are like really cheap. And I mean, that's a big step up because then it's like, okay, that's more redundant. You know, I mean, you, they're not losing information. They don't expect stuff to always work. It's a much more kind of mature attitude than, um, than eBay's, which I mean, was the only thing that they could do at the time, but yeah. So. I have a question about the new Facebook. The what? The distributed test software Yeah, well, which one? Yeah, um, a lot of the stuff that we didn't necessarily extend memcache, but we like built a bunch of stuff like ourselves. So I mean, right now it's not it's not open source. I mean, I like we consider doing it, and I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into making stuff open source, which I mean, it's like on top of whether or not you want to like lose the competitive advantage. It's just like it's kind of unfortunate because I mean, I think that if it were just easier to make something that like that, then then you could do it. Like you could just like release the code. But like, then there's a lot of support, you know, and like, and like licensing and all that stuff. And I don't know. We found that it's been kind of annoying. I mean, one of the things that we actually considered making open source was this search server that actually that guy sitting right there made um, <laughs> while he was still out in California. Um, and I guess like, we got to a point where MySQL was lagging a little on some of the searches that we were trying to do. And um, we decided that it would be a cool thing to do to just like make sort of a series of like distributed machines that could kind of, uh, he doesn't use a hash table. What's the structure that you use, McCollum? <laughs> so I mean, yeah, we, we thought about making that open, but, um, but then like that's when we kind of like had to do all this work to like come up with a license and we're just like, all right, you know, screw that. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yo. What do you spend most of your work on? Hiring people. Um, I guess like when, as you grow, like the most important thing is to have smart people, right? I mean, like, I and mean, if you think about how, uh, like, the technical leverage stuff that I was just talking about and answering that guy's question, um, like, as technology becomes sort of more generic and less expensive, the leverage point becomes more in the people. You know, so I mean, so if, and if you kind of think about this from a perspective of like a person to people time spent, or like user time spent or page view analysis, it's like because of technology now, like people are much more leveraged to kind of do, um, uh, and to do more things and just be more important in the equation. You know, so. It, because of that, it's like really important to get the most to get the most intelligent people. And also, I mean, it's like when you're a small company, then you can be really nimble and get a lot of stuff done. And there's relatively little bureaucracy. So if you have smart people who can take advantage of that to build cool things, then that's awesome. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess besides that, <laughs> um, I don't know, designing new things. There's not much corporate bureaucracy yet, so I don't have to waste that much time on that. <coughs> Keep on going. <laughs> Um, I have a lawyer who works for me full time. Okay. Yeah. Is there like a big part of running a business? Like, have you guys been working on the business really early on? Um, we didn't. And that, I guess, provided some annoyance later on. Um, I guess, like, getting stuff set up really well is good, right? I mean, it's like, it, getting stuff clean is really good. And I mean, no one's ever gonna tell you, like, oh, like a lawyer's bad. It's all just a, like a question of opportunity cost and what you prioritize, right? And like, I guess that in our case, it, it's like, we now have to deal with like a bunch of stuff that wasn't set up properly in the beginning. But like, I mean, actually most of that stuff is dealt with. So I mean, it's not even a big deal anymore. But like, but instead of, talking to lawyers early on, we were making stuff, you know? And like, I think that that was probably the right use of our time. So it's like, I mean, I think that one cool characteristic of a lot of the companies that end up being really successful, not that we are really successful, but I guess we also fall into this bucket, is that they started off as someone trying to make something cool and not someone trying to make a company. You know, and like, I mean, you kind of have, like, Google came out of um, Larry and Sergey's, like, PhD dissertation at Stanford. And Yahoo came out of just, like, I guess, also some Stanford guys just, like, kind of screwing around in their dorm room. And eBay came out of, like, some guy trying to build a marketplace for his girlfriend to exchange Pez dispensers. You know, I, Amazon was a little more calculated. Um, but, like, but, I mean, so I, I can't imagine that any of those people really had that much advice, and it seems to have worked out okay for them. But I mean, at the same time, I'm not going to kind of sit here and tell you not to get advice on stuff. I and mean, a lot of times, people are just like too careful, too. I mean, it's like I think it's more useful to like make things happen and then like apologize later than it is to make sure that you dot all your eyes now and then like just not get stuff done. Yeah. Go for it. Well, I mean, I think that I think that you're kind of always at that point, right? Um, I mean, most companies are started on like a couple of ideas, and those are like a few things that they do well, right? So, so I mean, Yahoo's was like, we're going to organize all this information in the world like by directory, right? And that was like what they started off doing, and then they kind of diversified out as time went on and built more stuff. And like, a lot of that stuff is like the core of their business now. I mean, it's like they didn't originally do search, you know, and now directory just like doesn't exist. You know, it just it sucks. You know, there's like no utility for it. Um, I mean, Google's big thing was just like they did PageRank, you know, and then I guess like out out of PageRank, they have search, and now they kind of extend that to do other similar type of algorithms, searching in other spaces. But I mean. You can kind of tell how like all the other stuff that they're doing is sort of tangential, and it's like they're trying really hard to like made, make PageRank and other types of algorithms that are very similar to that like work in their spaces, and it's it's just like not as elegant or pure of an idea as the original one was. Um, so I mean, Facebook, for example, when it just got started, like what I thought was the most interesting thing was just to be able to type in someone's name and find out information about them. I mean, there was like hardly any of the stuff that was there now. There's no groups. Um, there was no messages, even. There was poking. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, so it's like, you kind of get started on, like, some kind of core idea. And that's, like, and generally, like, the company will do well because, I guess, like, the people who are starting off working on that core idea kind of understand that single core idea in some sort of unique way, but that doesn't imply that they have any 
better understanding of anything else than anyone else. Yeah. So that's why kind of surrounding yourself with a lot of smart people is really important. Um, I mean, there's a lot of applications on the internet now that do that stuff, right? So I mean, Flickr is a pretty cool photo application. Although I think like in three weeks we passed them in the number of photos that we had on our site. But like, um, I mean, I think that the coolest thing about photos is that you can tag them in like in the way that makes them link to people's profiles and. I think that that's something that you can really only do if you have the context of like everyone around you on the site. You know, it's a, like that kind of requires a ubiquity of usage. Um, so I don't know if any of the other guys would have done that if they had that kind of use, but they didn't. Yeah. I don't know. Don't any of you guys have any CS questions? <laughs> Um, what's an idea? Oh, yeah, what's an example? So I looked at some of my stuff and said, so, you know, it would, you know, the next thing you want to do is picture the local people together. How do you go about figuring out mm -hmm. which technology is a good one? How do you mine to find technology? Which, do you have mm -hmm. any processes in place today that are, that are directed toward those sorts of things? Or does technology just come into the company because you were out someplace and somebody mentioned something you might want to do? Is that the case? So like, I think that m our process for filtering what technologies to use are like, trust the smart people, right? <laughs> so it's like, so we definitely have some people at the company who are just like really smart, you know? And like, and I think that most of the people at the company are generally pretty smart, but like, I mean, th there are a few guys in particular, I'm not one of them, um, who just like, who I think that when they say that like something is, generally like a good practice to go at it, then it's relatively like then they can get support for that pretty easily. And like and I think that a lot of the engineers sort of like build a consensus around that. Um, I'm trying to think of like a good example. I, I think that like it's somewhat goal oriented. So like with so with photos We, we knew that we wanted to support just people uploading unlimited photos. So I mean, there's no real concept of like unlimited. It's just like you have to keep on adding stuff, right? It, like keep on adding storage, and you want to make it so that um, it kind of works as seamlessly as possible. So the first thing that we were trying to do was like, well, let's evaluate like um, these companies that just do sort of large storage for a living, right? So like NetApp or something, network appliance. So we talked to them for a while, and then we're like, all right, well, we don't really want to go with like this like single big box approach. We want to go with like having um, just a, a series of distributed smaller boxes with a lot of hard drive and a lot of RAM. And so I think that the architecture that we first built was one where we had a bunch of those machines with relatively slow but very stable disk behind a level uh, a layer of caching boxes with like a ton of RAM that could hold most of the thumbnails and the most frequently accessed images in like I guess in, in like in RAM at any time. And then like right before we launched, it occurred to us that we were gonna have like some issues with this. And um and the issues that we were gonna have were gonna be network issues, not not like hard hardware issues. So like for example, if you take a photo album of 30 photos and each of your photos is three megabytes then you have to upload 90 megabytes to Facebook. And that kind of sucks, right? I mean, it sucks but like because people tend to have like not optimal connections and because um, like our router, like I guess most routers are set up to only be able to handle a gigabit at a time. So and routers are kind of expensive. They're like, they are big pieces of equipment. I don't think that there is a distributed version of that yet. But like, um, so we, couldn't in the time frame that we wanted to launch it just like get a new router and get it set up. So like, so what we ended up doing was building a Java applet and an ActiveX control that like <coughs> coupled the choosing of the photos that people wanted to upload with compression on the client side to make it smaller. 
And then like that way people can just like upload their photos relatively quickly. And then they're like we also save CPU on our side because we don't have to like do the compression on our side, although that wasn't that huge of a bottleneck. Um, so that worked. And then we got it to a point where we were uh, having uploads at a rate of like 100 a second. And like people were using the feature like way more than we thought we were going to. And even though we had this like caching tier set up, it just like still wasn't fast enough. And I'm sure you guys remember this. Like a few weeks ago, the site was not having a good time. Um, and like, so what we ended up doing at that point was kind of using edge caching, so like type, like Akamai type of stuff, to like make these photos, which are static content, just be closer to people. So that way, we can sort of offload some of the um, the equipment and the the sort of like having to transfer these still like somewhat large files to people. So that's where we are now, and it seems to be working pretty well. It's not like, it wasn't that we had any sort of upfront technical genius about it. It was just sort of that like at each point we sort of anticipated the issues or picked them out pretty quickly and then had enough competence to evaluate, I think, what the options were that we had and make what I think were decent decisions about how to execute on them. What's that? Take that to the next level, too, in terms of the problems you just talked about. Yeah. What's up? Um, so the way that, I guess like the methodology that we have is that um, I want it to be like as sort of, like as much of a meritocracy as possible where the people who can come up with the coolest solutions and implement them the quickest and have like the fewest bugs sort of get to work on like the stuff that they think is the most interesting and go off and like have the most influence in the company. So we're also onboarding a lot of people because we're hiring relatively quickly. And in doing so, we sort of have, we pair up like new people who are coming in with some like the better people who like who are sort of at like the top of the chain. And then um, we have them sort of like work with those people when they first come in to learn the stuff that they're working on uh, so, so that the new guys, like the incoming class, can sort of like learn what like some of the people who are currently at the company are working on. And I think in doing that, they pick up the style and sort of the methods that we use for doing stuff. But I think that like, I don't know. I mean, it, it changes pretty quickly. I think one difference between sort of the way stuff works in a company and the way stuff works in school is that this is a very iterative process. Right? And like, I mean, it's nice when you get stuff right the first time, but like, we don't need to. And I think that a lot of companies go through phases where they just like, or stages where they don't get stuff right the first time. Like Microsoft, I mean, I don't know when the last time was that they had a good product before version four. You know, but like by the time they get to version four, it's like always good. You know, for the most part. So, um, and I think that like works out pretty well for them. And I mean, Google always like releases their stuff in beta. So, we sort of like, I guess, we try to have multiple people work on the same thing so everyone can learn from each other and like to kind of pick off some of the mistakes that might be made that we can I guess like reduce pretty quickly. But like I guess in general the idea is that it doesn't have to be perfect the first time around. And as long as you get the architecture as right as possible, then a lot of the other implementation stuff isn't going to be as big of a deal and you can sort of work that out at any time. I don't know if that's sort of asking answering the question that you asked. But. Um, the internet's a pretty good tool. Yeah. Um, I think that like that that's how we did most of it. I mean, we usually, I mean, we kind of make a point of not hiring people for skills because 
I guess the theory is like if someone has skills in an area and has been doing it for 10 or 15 years, then that's probably what they can do. You know, and like that's good, and that means that they can do that. But if you hire someone, so say like right out of college, you know, or someone younger who you're just hiring them for raw intelligence, then the idea is that they're going to be able to learn stuff re really quickly. And there's a lot of information available just like all over the place. And I mean, now within recent years, there's like good tools for sorting through that. And like, um, I think that the most performant people we have are like sort of younger people who didn't necessarily know that much about anything specific coming out of college. I mean, a good example is like, I mean, Dustin, my roommate at Harvard, wasn't even a CS major. He was an economics major. You know, and he's just like a really smart dude and was able to pick it up. Um, some of the other good people we have are EE majors out of Stanford, you know, or Berkeley. And I mean, it's not, they aren't even CS all the time. Like math people, it's like if you studied math, you can learn this stuff relatively quickly you know, a lot of the time. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I never really hire people just because they have business skills. Like I think that like, I mean, it's actually kind of funny, but knowledge of a lot of core CS stuff is really important in business too. So I mean, one of the main things that you learn when you're studying CS is like complexity and scale, and like that is like a huge issue in business too. It's like how do you go from having five people to a hundred people, and like what's like kind of the change in the dynamic there. Um, and like, how are certain processes? Like, how is a sales force going to scale from like five people to a hundred people? You know, and I mean, it's like the same type of intelligence that figure that can figure out both of those problems. And it's like it might be a different type of person who cares to solve the problems. But like, um, I think that like the the second part of my answer to what you said is that I think we're sort of continually in the process of building out infrastructure, and I don't think you ever get out of that process. And like, we're kind of Focusing not on just building something and figuring out how to make money off of it and sort of like maximizing the value of our business in the short term, but instead sort of like always looking to maximize what the long term value would be. And I think that in doing that, you kind of need to always just be building out your base and not at any time be worried about maximizing your money. Um, our peaks are pretty strong. So like at five in the morning, there's like, no matter how many users we have signed up, there's always like 5,000 people in, and that's it. And then like, if you get to like 9 p.m. Pacific, so like midnight here, which I guess is like the peak across the country, it's like close to 400,000 people using it simultaneously. And like, um, it's actually kind of interesting because I mean, we like monitor these graphs and we have this huge LCD in our office and like whenever there's a blip in the traffic we're like oh crap what happened and a lot of times it's like Laguna Beach, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, um, but usually it doesn't swing that far the other way. Um, right now we don't, but. We may at some point in the future. Okay, I'd like to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. What kind of issues do you talk about at the company in terms of privacy and security, all those sorts of things? Are you worried about it at all? Or do you put your, yeah. do your privacy and security statement on, online here? Mm -hmm. Or do you just put it up and then not worry about it anymore? Well, I mean, I think that and what makes Facebook fun and useful is that there's a lot of information about a lot of people that you can get. But what's more important is that the information is available to the people who that person wants that information to be available to. And the flip side of that is that the information is available to the people who want to have access to that information. So I mean, one of the kind of the core decisions that we made was only to let people at the same school see each other's profiles. And I mean, I guess the idea behind that was that you're at Harvard, like you probably wouldn't have that 
hard of a time just like letting someone else at Harvard see your information. But it, at the same time, it's like only people who, at Harvard who you're probably going to see on a day-to-day -day basis and maybe meet who are ever going to want to look you up. You know, it's like it's not like some kid out at Stanford who you will never talk to is going to be interested in knowing what your cell phone number is, you know, or like what you're interested in. So by limiting the scope of the information to like sort of as narrow as makes sense, I think that we solve a lot of those issues. And then I mean, we also give people complete control over like how like what parts of their profile get shown. So we don't force anyone to show anything, and we like I guess um, give people granular control over some of the more sensitive stuff. So like right next to the cell phone field, there's like another field that's like who do you want to show this to? Just your friends, you know, just people at your school, what? So I mean like we care about it because if people stop, if pe people feel like their information isn't private, then that screws us in the long term too. Um, it's very hard to control what people do with information that they have access to. I, I mean, there's like the best that we can do is give people control over their information and who can see it. And then once they let someone see it, it's sort of like out of anyone's control. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, I originally threw that together in like a half an hour. And um, I guess like it was pretty complicated because, or it was more complicated than I thought it was going to be. And I think like part of the reason why we changed it was because it didn't work as well as we wanted it to. And the original goal was to sort of make it so that you can have this wiki type thing on people's profiles that when you moused over something, it showed who kind of added that part of it. But like, I guess there were a lot of cases that that we missed, or it just like wasn't well designed by me. And like, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but like you used to like mouse over stuff and it just like wasn't as good. It, and like it might like tell you the wrong person or it might highlight like more than it was supposed to. So I mean, so I kind of like coupled that with thinking like, you know, this isn't even the best feature. You know, it's like, it would be much more interesting if instead of having to mouse over stuff, people could just like, see the picture and the name of the person who posted everything without having to like just go through the whole wall. So over the summer, we just kind of went through and wrote a better parser for the walls and tried to decompose them. And then going forward, we made it so that you just added a post and it went to the top of the wall. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to make something where people could type in someone's name and get some information about a person. Thought that would be cool. Oh yeah. Um, I'm interested in the feature of the you could SMS someone with mm -hmm. the name and the text information if you wanted and like send it back. Mm -hmm. I, I I didn't know a lot of people were using this, so I'm just wondering if there are any practical considerations or designs to it. So I mean, the SMS gateways um, also have like an email counterpart. So it's like if your phone number is like X, then and, and you have singular as your provider, then like you could email X at singular.com or some variant of that and the text message would go to your phone. And um, that's a free gateway. So I mean you know how like when you text message people a lot of times like depending on what your cell phone plan is, it'll it'll cost you money. If you do it through email, it actually doesn't cost any money. So that's how we chose to do it. Um, we were doing a high volume of them, and we decided that it would just be like a better thing for us to do, to actually like kind of do it the legit way and send a text message directly to the cell phone as opposed to going through the email gateways. So we're kind of in the process of getting that set up now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that we're like always looking for more stuff to do. 
I don't think that we're competing with MySpace, but and I think it's kind of a different type of application. Yeah. So I mean, I did that so that people couldn't go through and scrape the pages. I and mean, we have a lot of stuff that we put in place to make sure that people don't aggregate information off of Facebook. And you obviously, like, you, you can't see profiles of people at other schools. But also, if you try to view a lot of profiles, it like picks up that you're just viewing an abnormal number of profiles. And we also sort of, like, just by analyzing user activity, we've built like Bayesian filters that I guess just like let us pick out abnormal activity like really quickly and just kind of show very limited information to those users. But like one of the things that we wanted to do, we wanted to make sure we wanted to make it especially difficult for anyone to try to scrape email addresses because that's really annoying if people get spam. So we figured that by making it an image instead of plain text, that just added like an extra level of complexity in terms of scraping. Um, well, we can use it to target posters to you, for example. Um, I don't know if any of you guys bought posters off of that, but like we sort of like I mean, we're trying to figure out what we could do with that, but we're obviously like really sensitive to people's privacy. I mean, what's up? Yeah, I think we're actually going to be releasing something like in like late this week or next week that shows some aggregate statistics that we think are interesting. I don't know. I mean, it, the stuff is kind of cool, but it's not like the type of thing that you come back to every day. No CS questions? I'm especially disappointed that Will Chen didn't ask me any questions. <laughs> we'll work on Will later. <laughs> That's it. Any more? Oh, we got a couple more. Cool. Do you ever look back on any Facebook? <laughs> Every last one of you. What's up? Do you ever look back on any other Facebook? Of course. I mean, I think that there's value to like to the to what people do on the site, but I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, I don't know if you think this is too but like, what kinds of features can we expect in the future? Anything you guys working on? Um, well, I can tell you what we're going to do in the next two weeks. Um, so, I mean, there's the thing that I just kind of mentioned before, where we're aggregating a bunch of stats and just kind of show like what's hot and like what's changing. Um, and also just like surprising statistics that we found. So like 2% of people at Harvard are libertarian, for example, or something like that. Um, I think that another thing that we're, that we're going to launch hopefully sometime either late this week or next week is something that allows people to clarify their relationships with other people. So I mean, a lot of the problems that that we kind of deal with at Facebook aren't always technical, but they're sometimes like they're social problems, you know? And it's like, one thing that I think is, is really interesting is, you know, if you have 100 or 150 friends, it's like, how well do you know each of those people? And who are maybe like the five people who you actually care about, you know, like a lot? And that's not something that you can really answer right now because the connections are binary. You know, it's either like you are connected or you're not. So I've been trying to think for a while about like, how we could design something that would make it so that people could express how close they were to people in sort of an unbiased way. So I mean, you can imagine like if you made a feature that was just like rate your friendship on a scale of one to ten, that would not work, right? Because like first of all, like no one would want to do that because that's like you're like insulting someone if you're like you're a three, you know. But um, like it's also like kind of boring, you know, and so no one would want to do it because of that. 
And like it would just be skewed by social pressure in the same way that, that friends are, that like some people have a different have a different sense of what a friend is to them than like another person would. You know, so I mean, it's like if someone has thirty friends and another person has hundred or fifty friends, it's like, does that person actually have more friends in real life? Like maybe or maybe not, and maybe the person with thirty just has a higher threshold for making someone a friend on Facebook. So I mean I guess like the solution that we kind of came up with for this was to make to like kind of judge relationships based on bidirectional factual statements. So for example, I took CS50 with this person, or I lived in a house with this person. Um, and like there's just kind of a bunch of different ways to do stuff like that. But I mean, I figured that that would probably be a little more accurate because like it's like no one's going to, like there's no pressure to lie about something like that. It's not like, what are you talking about? I didn't take CS50 with you. You know, um, but like if someone aggregates like a lot of different connections, then you, that kind of means something. So I mean, you take someone like Dustin, who is my roommate here, um, and it's like, okay, well, we lived together in Kirkland House, then we um, worked on Facebook, then we like moved out to Palo Alto, and now like we're still working on Facebook. Then like maybe that's that's like a that's like enough connections to say like, okay, well, this person like clearly has a lot to do with this person. You know, um, whereas if um, if like the only category that you know someone through is like this person's my Facebook friend, then that also means something. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see how it works. Nothing's for sure. What's up? Um, it's a combination. <laughs> so I mean, I think that like. Another thing that's pretty important for each of these events is the date at which they occur. So it's like, I mean, if you had, for example, like a date on each person's friendship with each person, then that would give you a more accurate representation of, of like what that meant, right? Because right now you don't know what friend means to like, to each of the people on the network, and because you don't know when that friendship was formed, you don't know like what has changed in their relationship since that friendship is formed. But I mean, even if the per like friendship means very little to someone, if you know that like that that, that happened yesterday that they became friends, then you still like know that there's some that there's some strength or it, it's like a certainty thing. You know, it's like there's like a lower certainty that their relationship has diverged since that point if the date at which the action occurred was sooner. So um, sorry, more recent. So I think that that's one of the things that we're kind of focusing on here is like I took a course, I took CS50 with someone this term is a lot different than saying like I'm a senior now and I took CS50 with this person when I was a freshman. And I mean a lot of these like the analysis of how like people look at this and see the relationships isn't necessarily like Facebook isn't going to rate the relationship. It's sort of people have an implicit understanding of what the difference is between having taken CS50 with someone this term and having taken CS50 with them three years ago. So I mean, I think that that'll kind of help out. Yeah. What's up? Um, not two. Because I think that a lot of this stuff, we sort of have a very unique platform for building it. Like, I don't think that there's any other company or like group of people in the world who could develop this right now, right? Um, I mean, even Google, with their like 5,000 engineers, is not in a place to like make an application that sort of characterizes people's relationships like this. And it's like the same thing with the photo tagging. It's like we could do that because. I mean, photo tagging only works if everyone around you is on the site, right? Because I mean, otherwise you're going to get a type of use where it's like you go and you upload a photo and you go to tag a bunch of people and they're not there and that sucks, right? So like, even if 50% of the people at Harvard were on Facebook, then the tagging and the way that we set it up would still suck. So like, it only works because 97% of the people at Harvard are on Facebook or whatever. So like, so because of that, um, it's like not that big of a concern. You know? Yeah. Is this sort of a software engineering sort of sandwich or something sort of way? I mean, when somebody has like one of these ideas, like, let's ask every group this why does this even tell people? Or I have a way to measure this, that, and the other about these people, or to mm -hmm. mark up this thing on people's profiles. I mean, when, how do they go about getting the sort of the go ahead from everyone else in the company to like spend some time technically working on that? Or 
so it get other people to work on CSS and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of people, like, I mean, the people who work at Facebook really like working at Facebook, I think, for the most part, and spend a lot of their time doing that. And like, a lot of the time that they're spending, they spend like working on stuff that might be sort of like strategically important to like what we're trying to do at that point. But also like a lot of people just mess around with the code base and like kind of like put if statements in there that's like if the user is me, then like put this in there, you know? And like, and then I mean, so like I walk around to different people's places during the day or like people come and talk to me. I, I hold CEO office hours as a joke, like from two to four every day, not today. But um, and like people just come and like show me different stuff that they're doing. And I mean a lot of it is like relatively cool. And I mean stuff that I like wouldn't have necessarily thought of. So I mean I guess like you asked before if we were saving, if we were archiving old profile information. And one of the reasons why I said that we might start doing it is because one of the guys at the company came up with something where it's like, you, so you go to your friends page and it shows your recently updated friends. And then you click on that and it shows their new profile, but there's no indication of what changed. You know, so, um, so one of the guys made something that keeps an old version of his profile and then makes it so that when you go to his profile, when he updates it, it highlights in yellow like the parts of it that were changed. And like, I think that that's pretty cool. You know, and it's not like a huge project. I mean, it actually kind of is if we have to start storing everyone's information. But like, but I mean, it's it's somewhat cool, you know. It's not like the type of thing that like that you necessarily are bound to come up with. But I definitely think it's like a pretty big improvement over what we have now. You know, it's just like now it's like really hard to like go to someone's profile and tell it changed. So, and that's just the most recent example that I have. Um. So. I don't want to do that. And the reason is because I think that Facebook is a directory. And the primary purpose is to look up someone, right? Like type in their name and get some information about them. And like one of the things that's really useful is that everyone's page is structured in the same way. So if you want to see if someone's single, you don't have to like scan down the columns until you get to relationship status. You just know where that is. You know, and like so you like click go to like your eyes just like go to that thing. But like if you had like different people changing their CSSs in different ways, then like that could become annoying, especially if people are doing stuff like, like dark blue text on black backgrounds, and it just gets like kind of obnoxious. So yeah. Um, the purpose for me of the high school one was the same. I think that like. I think that the application, I mean, this is going to probably sound pretty stupid, but like wanting to look people up, I think, is like kind of a core human desire, <laughs> right? It's like, I mean, I think that like people just want to know stuff about other people. So I think that um, providing an interface where people can just type in someone's name and like get some information about them is just generally a pretty useful thing. So I mean, growth has been pretty good. It was tough to figure out exactly how to gauge it because we, like when we did college, we opened it up at Harvard. Then we opened it up at like a couple of colleges around Harvard. And the idea was always we were really short on money and equipment. So while getting as little equipment as possible, we want to maximize our growth. So we want to launch at as at the schools that we think are going to grow the quickest based on the fact that the people at those schools are going to have the most number of friends at the schools that we're already at. Uh, we took a different approach for high school because we could just launch it everywhere at the same time. So we didn't really know how it was going to grow. I think it's growing at like more than 5,000 people a day, which is pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you started with Facebook, did you intend for it to become this full-fledged business? No. Or, okay. <laughs> well, how did you Um. I mean, I remember like, thinking that it would be cool if you could have a directory of everyone. I remember like arguing with my parents about this, because after I almost got kicked out of school for like this project that I did before Facebook, um, like, they were like, what good could possibly come of like doing something new? And I'm like, no, nah, this is pretty cool. I'm like, just like, imagine like, what we, how cool it would be if like, you could just like, type in someone's name and get some information about them. And they were like, I, just, I, don't, I don't see it. You know? And I'm like, well, like, I'm like we'll just do it at Harvard for now, but like imagine like what happens if like one day you could just like type in anyone's name and get some information about them, and like, 
That'd be kind of cool, right? <laughs> so um, they didn't buy it, but now they do. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so I don't know. I guess like at each phase, we're just kind of looking at like a natural way to preserve the integrity of the network and also to make it so that it's more useful, I guess is like the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just suggest that you take the hardest courses that you can because you learn the most when you challenge yourself, right? So like 161 just like ruined my life and I learned so much from it. <laughs> um, 121 I also found pretty hard. Um, 124 kind of changed the way I thought about stuff. Like, what well, 124 taught me that I think was really useful was that there are like I mean, I think a lot of people focus on how to do stuff as well as possible, and like kind of like how to make like the most efficient algorithm. But like what has always gotten us by isn't doing it, isn't like doing stuff in the most efficient way, but laying the framework and like in a pretty efficient way. So I mean, it kind of teaches you both sides of the problem, like data structures and algorithms, and like how the setup is really important. And I mean, that's definitely like saved our ass in scaling a lot of times. Um, I don't know. Work with smart people. Learn from people. Yeah. Um, people can make whatever they want, but that doesn't mean that they can put it on the site. So I mean, like, um, I think that like before stuff goes on the site, a lot of people see it, and like I mean, I definitely like check off on it before it can go live. But I mean, I think that people have a lot of creativity to do cool stuff, and a lot of the times, like, it's like you someone can come up with a cool idea, but like that doesn't mean it's the final way that it would happen, <laughs> you know? So like, so for example, people putting like highlighting in yellow, like what the changes are in their profile. I think that just the concept of, of highlighting stuff that has changed is really good, but the interface that that guy used for it isn't what I think is the best one, and the way that he's storing the old profile information isn't optimal either, and I mean, that kind of is cool because he was just doing it for himself, but like, but I mean, if we were ever going to make something live out of that, which I mean, I want to, we'd do it in a different way. So and it's more just like a mock-up. So like the idea is come from like the ground up and then it's like the top down design. I mean, it goes both ways, and like I'm not completely unopinionated. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, so I mean, a lot of the solutions that we come up with stuff aren't technical or organizational, but just applying social <laughs> pressure in good ways. So I mean, MySpace has almost a third of their staff is monitoring the pictures that get uploaded for pornography. We hardly ever have any pornography uploaded. And like, I think that a lot of the reason is that people use their real names on Facebook, you know? and like. And your real email address, you know, for school. And like, if you have that, then you're not going to upload pornography, you know. And I think that like that's a really simple social solution to a possibly complex technical issue, you know. So um, 
I mean, that said, like we changed we changed some of the features around for high school. So, for example, we took parties out because we figured that like parents would get pissed off or like it would just like break up all the keg parties really quickly and that would suck for everyone. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, we de-emphasize contact information in high school. Yeah. Well, why don't we end here? If you have other questions, feel free to come down and talk as much. Thank you very much. Yeah.